Football Forward, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast here. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill on a Monday edition of the Bash here on 97.3 ESPN, 97.3 ESPN mobile app. And we are live, as always, on YouTube and Twitter at 97.3 ESPN. We're joining us right now to talk more about the Eagles. Eagles already starting to make some moves, already getting things chopped up as we are less than 24 hours away from the initial 53 Jeff Mosher, Inside the Birds, joins us right now. The latest edition dropped this morning. But, Jeff, when you guys dropped the pod this morning, you didn't have the Rodney McLeod and uh, Lander Dickerson news. So, Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Josh. I uh, hope you're doing well as well. Uh, no, we didn't know exactly what the future was in store for Landon Dickerson or Rodney McLeod. They have been activated, each of them. So that's good. That means they'll start the season on the 53-man roster. And, and I would think they're going to start the season – just on that and that doesn't mean they're going to be ready for week one but it gives you a kind of an idea that they probably think that somewhere between week three and six they'll be ready to go obviously with Rodney he kind of slides back in there you assume and and right now they really could use him only because Kevon Wallace has been injured and so they're already kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel a little bit at safety but uh, Landon Dickerson will be interesting. It'll be very interesting to see how keeping him impacts what they do with depth at other interior offensive line spots and um, how quickly they think that they should or can or need to get him on the field or, or when injuries you know happen, we'll see if he can get in there. Now, with Dickerson basically looking like he's going to be on the, 53, the initial 53-man roster, how does this impact the rest of the offensive line? Because we know, according to Albert Breer and other reports, Teams are calling the Eagles about offensive linemen, so do the Eagles, instead of just waving all the guys they need to wave, do they start trading some of these guys off potentially? I mean, I think uh, there are certain guys the Eagles could probably try to put on the trading block to see if they can get anything for, but only because they were not going to make the team anyway. There's one guy I, I think that we'll talk about it in a second, but take Matt Pryor and Sua Opeta, two guys who have played in the NFL prior more than Opeta. Um who are just not going to make the team, you know, Matt Pryor, we've kind of seen be very inconsistent, but they're both going to become victims of the numbers game anyway. So there's a chance in this, in the NFL, because the league is so deficient offense at offensive line league wide, that these two guys could get jobs somewhere. So maybe Howie Roseman is able to flip one, if not both of them for a very, a day three type of draft pick. But Nate Herbig is a guy who, now I think is suddenly in jeopardy a little bit because of, and same with, same with little Raven Clark, I'll say they're, they're in a little bit of a middle ground there because the team now has options um, as far with, with, with Nate Herbig, he's been a backup center first and then a guard last year. But now you have Jack Driscoll who was a tackle last year was cross trained to guard and they really like it guard. So he's going to make the team as a potential tackle or a potential guard. So that gives them one backup guard. Uh, and Landon Dickerson's obviously another backup guard who can also play center. So what does that do for Nate Herbig, who in that totem pole would be the third backup guard? The only thing is that Nate Herbig can play center. And if Jason Kelsey, Kelsey gets hurt week one, I'm not sure yet they're ready to go ahead with Landon Dickerson from a health standpoint. So that might save Herbig's spot. Uh, LaRaven Clark is, a, is an interesting guy because he plays tackle and guard also. So he gives you that versatility. And if, my lot of work to get hurt. You may not be comfortable right now with Andre Dillard at left tackle. You might want uh, LaRaven Clark. But, Josh, I would say Brett Toth actually played fairly well this preseason. And in that last game, I don't know if everybody noticed it, but when they started Andre Dillard at left tackle, they played Toth at left guard. Right. And he seemed to hold up pretty well there. So here's a guy who I think is challenging to make the team as a guy who can be a backup tackle slash guard. And that might enable the team to look at – LaRaven Clark and say, hey, if we can trade him for something, anything, we feel comfortable enough with Driscoll and, and uh, Brett Toth and Landon Dickerson and Dillard that we don't need LaRaven. We, we can trade LaRaven Clark, even though they, they kind of signed him because he's both versatile and, and he had starts in the league. He was experienced. We know that Stoutland likes his offensive line to have flexibility, to be able to do multiple things. It's one of the things that makes guys like Driscoll, and you mentioned Toth now, Valuable to the Eagles. Herbert can play guard and center. Even Dickerson can play guard and center. I mean, mm -hmm. theoretically, if you had to, you could kick him out to tackle if it's an emergency as well, probably, just because of his size athleticism. Uh, does that 
maybe lead you to think that Dillard is becoming less valuable, at least in Stoutland's eyes? I, I Perhaps, Josh, but the thing is, what do you do with Andre Dillard? You can put him on the trading block, but he's a former first-round pick. If you're Howie Roseman, do you, do you trade Andre Dillard for anything less than a third-rounder? You probably don't feel good about that. So at that point, and, by, and if you're any other NFL team, are you giving up a third rounder or something better for Andre Dillard, who has not played nearly to first or second round potential and honestly hasn't even, I don't think he's played better than Brett Toth at this point. So what are you willing to give up for Andre Dillard if you're a team that needs some offensive tackle help? So I feel like it's going to leave the Eagles in the position where they might as well just hang on to him and continue to try to get, get him coached up by Jeff Stoutland. And the fact that he doesn't have to start Josh, maybe that means you can now start to cross-train him a little bit more, see if you can get him to play a little bit of right tackle. It was a not a very good experience the first time, but he was thrown into a game and a week of practice having to do that. It wasn't a situation where, like right now, you don't have to play him and you can just simply work on practicing and cross-training with him. I, I think that there's more value right there in that than, than trying to flip him for a day three pick, which I don't think Howie would take for a former first rounder. So that puts them in the position where yes, he it's not ideal because he has to take up a roster spot. Um, but it, he, he just don't cut him at this point. You still try to, to develop him. Football at four powered by the inside the birds podcast at Jeff Mosher NFL on Twitter. The latest edition of the inside the birds podcast dropped this morning. Also check out all the coverage at inside the birds.com. Now, let's go deeper into Rodney McLeod. You know, the handicap the safety situation, Jeff, because let's be realistic. Marcus Epps actually played well overall in the preseason. But you, like you said, we didn't really see Kevon Wallace. We don't really know what his development is at this point. You know, there are guys who you got to wonder how many safeties do they keep. And depending on how many safeties they keep depends on what they do at other positions. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is a position where you can see them going heavy on the initial 53 Right. You're going to keep Anthony Harris. You're going to keep obviously Rodney is now on it. You're going to keep Kavon Wallace. You're going to keep Epps and probably. Well, that's interesting because you have Andrew Adams. Right. And you've Mm -hmm. got um, and you've got Elijah Riley. And I think Elijah Riley has a pretty good chance to make the team on special teams. Now, Adams is a guy they signed also for special teams, but he's a vested vet. So he's someone you I believe is a vested vet. So uh, you could technically cut Andrew Adams. And then kind of roll the dice week one with Harris. And, well, it kind of depends on whether Kamal Wallace can play. I mean, he's been hurt and, and he was in, he was out, he's in, he's out. You may just have to go kind of heavy there for a week or two just because a couple of guys are not ready to play in McLeod and Wallace. And then by week two or week three, make a decision uh, somewhere else. You know, when, when inevitably the injuries start to pile up, you may release a safety to sign uh, a different player at a different position. Now, before we get to anything else, I promise we get to this, and I open the show talking about this. We do have to address. I'll wait for you to drink. You finish drinking what you're drinking. So you don't spit it out of the place. Um, the, the the Gardner Minshew stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Jeff, I picked a horrible day to take a personal day off on Saturday because that's when the Minshew trade went down. I saw everyone texting the station, losing their stinking minds about what this deal is. And to me, this deal comes down to two things. One. Nick Mullins' arm is noodle at this point. He, he just hasn't recovered from that surgery. And two, like you and Adam said on the podcast, David Caldwell is here. And the Eagles have a history, whether it's Joe Douglas or Andrew Berry or John Dorsey or David Caldwell, these guys get in Howie's ear and Howie always makes a deal that has to do with those guys. So to me, that's why Minshew is here. To me, there's no conspiracy. There's no craziness. I mean, yeah, the Eagles might flip one of these guys like, Black or a Minshew, if someone called him, call him with a nice deal. But to me, that's why Minshew is here. So, I, I, you know, I, I at times disagree with the Eagles and their kind of quarterback philosophy. And, um, you know, we can go. No one needs to have the argument now about whether or not you take a, a backup quarterback in the second round. But that is, an, that is a philosophy that certainly if you pull fans, reporters, league people, you're going to get some division among people on that, right? But what I will say is the Eagles aren't lying to you. They, they, they demonstrated over and over again that they are constantly looking for the best young developmental quarterbacks that they can find to either be 
good starters out of nowhere or, or, or great backups who are cost efficient, right? They, they, they've told you this. They do not want to be paying $20 million anymore for backup quarterbacks or, or even eight or nine or 10 from Chase Daniel to whatever they paid Nick Foles in his last year. It was a lot of money and they've had cap issues because of it. So this is an example of a guy who the reason, the biggest reason he's here, Josh, along with what you said about the Jacksonville connection with Dave Caldwell is that he has two years left on his contract. So he could potentially be the backup quarterback in 2022, making like a million dollars, right? And the fact that he's already played in the NFL, he's shown you he can come in and move the chains and be pretty good at certain times means that you might have next year a pretty good backup quarterback for a really low cost money. Somebody who can step in and win you games, right? But as for right now, Joe Flacco is the backup quarterback, and Gardner Minshew just got here. So if Jalen Hurts sprains his ankle in the third quarter of the season opener against Atlanta, Gardner Minshew ain't going in. Joe Flacco's going in. If it's week five, week six, and Jalen Hurts gets hurt, Joe Flacco's going in the game, especially if the Eagles are somewhat competitive this year and they're not out of it. Now, if Jalen Hurts gets hurt in November, December, or something like that, the Eagles are out of it or Hertz is going to be sidelined for five or six weeks. Sure, at that point, it makes sense to say, well, let's play Minshew here, um, you know, just to see what we've got. And he can start to learn, not just learn our playbook, but execute our plays in a real game. And then that'll give him the leg up on the backup quarterback competition next year. And um, it gives us a young kind of quarterback to get a, a good look at. But that that's basically it, okay? Your, your number one quarterback is Jalen Hurts. Your backup is Joe Flacco. And... Your, your number three developmental guy is Minshew, who would have a chance to play later in the year under certain situations. That's how I, I see it. Now, some people have said, well, maybe this gives them the opportunity to flip Joe Flacco. I don't know. Who's trading for Joe Flacco? I mean, it's not like he had a huge market this offseason. He only signed for $3.5 million. That's not even on the high end for backup quarterbacks. But I suppose if someone loses a quarterback and falls in love with Joe Flacco – then maybe a deal can be made. But I think a little bit that that's looking way down, down the line, in my opinion. I think we're, I'm just laying it out to you as what the team is thinking right now. Well, also there is that speculation because Wentz went on the COVID list and Sam Ellinger got injured in Indianapolis as Jacob Easton and nobody else and that they could maybe you know go hunting for a quarterback. But also we know that uh, the Bears are shopping Foles apparently. So, I mean, it's not like you know, if, if, you, if you're an NFL team, you got to choose between Foles and Flacco. I mean, you're, that, that, that means your options are not really good anyway. Yeah, if you're, if you're that team, you're probably hoping you either drafted a quarterback or you have a Gardner Minshew type player that you might as well take a look at for the year. Jeff Mosher, Inside the Birds podcast, joining us here on Football at Four on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, let's get to a couple other the, uh, the roster situations, as we call them. I thought you and Jeff, uh, sorry, you, Jeff, and Adam had a great conversation on the pod today about this wide receiver situation. And all I could think of this morning is I'm listening to you guys in the pod, and then on my phone pops up, hey, the Lions cut Brashad Breland. And I'm just thinking, (laughs) I mean, I'm sorry, Brashad Perryman, I'm just like, you know what? This sounds like a move the Eagles would do. Just be like, let's just cut all the receivers and just bring in Brashad Perryman to be the fifth receiver. Like, I could totally see that happening because as you guys expressed, it's not like Fulgham or J-Jaw have really made themselves indispensable at this point. No, not at all. Um, in fact, I mean, with, with Fulgham, he's done the opposite. He's made himself the target of concern, I would say, for the coaches because they wonder if they'll ever be able to unlock this guy like he was last year. I mean, it's no secret he's fallen down the totem pole. When you're playing mostly the second half of the last preseason game, that's pretty telltale as to where you are on the depth chart and how the team sees you. And I just know for a fact that this coaching staff has been disappointed with what they've seen over the last few weeks. I mean, he may have had a nice practice here and there. I heard he was okay against the Jets. But I think when you look in totality, you wanted to see a whole lot more from Travis Fulgham. He is the type of guy, Josh, that I feel like has a chance to be on that initial 53. But it would not surprise me at all if 24 to 48 out to 48 hours later, he's not on the 53. And if there's any kind of trade value in him, I could see how he's trying to to package him or or trade him or do something to uh, in a in a type of player for player trade 
if that if they could uh, upgrade it. I don't know that Brashad Perriman is somebody they're going to want to bring in only because, man, if you get cut by the Lions, you know, you've obviously been very disappointed. It's not like the Lions are just bursting with wide receiver talent either. And they gave that guy, didn't they give him like $2 million guaranteed when they, I, I forget what they gave him. But, you know, I thought, I think when the Lions signed him, they thought he was going to factor into their wide receiver rotation, which has taken a big hit over the last few years. You know, lost Kenny Galladay, don't have Marvin Jones Jr. anymore. I, I don't even know who they really have uh, off the top of my head. They didn't draft Jalen Waddle. They took the um, they took the right tackle, right, Penny Suell in, yep. in uh, the first round. So uh, I don't know who their who their wide receiver talent is at the moment. But the fact that they cut Brashad Perriman just shows you how disappointing he's been to them. So I don't know if you want to trade your own disappointing player to bring in a disappointing player. But stranger things have happened. Yeah, Perry Man, like you said, signed a $2.5 million one-year deal back in March. He was competing with Tyrell Williams, Geronimo Allison, Tom Kennedy, and Victor Bolden for roster spots. Oh, man. I don't know where Jared Goff is on your fantasy football quarterback <laughs> rankings, but he's not very high on mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently it looks like in Detroit that uh, Quintus Cephas and rookie Amon Ross St. Brown are going to make the team with Khalif Raymond, and that's part of the reason why they are cutting uh, mm. Perryman and Victor Bolden. Well, I like Cephas. That that kid came from, I think, Wisconsin, yep. if I'm not mistaken. And I don't know. Whenever he played against Penn State, it seemed like he was making big play right. after big play. So I like that player. But that's still not a team where if you're Brashad Perryman, you should have been on the outside looking in. You should have had a, a guaranteed uh, roster spot there. So there's obviously a lot of buyer beware with him. Jeff, let's flip it back over to the defense. I'm very fascinated to find out what happens with the linebackers because, you know, we don't, still don't know exactly what Gannon's defense is going to do. Like, we have theories. We have understandings of what he likes to do. But, you know, where does Avery fit into all this? Does Sean Bradley make the team? We know who the top three linebackers are, Wilson, Singleton, and Edwards. But what about the guys after that? Davion Taylor has been injured the entire month of August, it seems like. Like, they got a lot of questions that still haven't really been answered. Oh, definitely. And, you know, starting with this, I, I think the, the what we can answer is they want to be in nickel for most of the time, like a lot of NFL teams now. And when they're going to be in nickel, there's Eric Wilson and there's Alex Singleton. And honestly, I'm not sure. That's not even a debate, right? TJ Edwards has had a good camp and he's going to make it. And he can play in certain packages as well. Um, if they want to go in goal line, right, get that third linebacker on there, some a little bulk. They can put him in if one of those two guys I mentioned gets hurt. I think they're, they, I know that they've been impressed with TJ's ability to kind of transform himself from a bigger, stout guy when he first got here into someone who trimmed down a little bit, can run a little better, uh, can cover a little better now than he was two years ago. So he's not exactly what he used to be as far as just a downhill linebacker. I think he's got some good fit in this defense and can play it in a backup role. But after that, you're right. Not only do you not know who the depth is, I mean, uh, Davion Taylor is going to make the team, but he certainly has a long, long, long way to go. Um, but also that Sam linebacker position to me is in flux because Jannard Avery can, can play it, but he's he's been practicing there. Um, but he's also been hurt, right? And if you're going to have that as a position on the team, if you're going to have, we're going to have a Sam linebacker who plays, you know, 20, 30% of the snaps in certain situations, well, then you can't just have a starting one like Avery. You need to make sure you have a backup, too, in case Avery gets hurt and somebody who can practice there. So who's that going to be? Patrick Johnson has had a nice camp, but he's a rookie. So are they really comfortable going in with a guy who's never really played that position before? You know, Avery has mostly been a pass rusher. And then a rookie to occupy a, a position that you, you ideally wanted to play 20 to 30 percent of the time? Or does Jonathan Gannon take a step back and say, I just don't have the personnel to do this this year with with you know, with this squad. So I'm going to be more traditional in my linebacker and just look for the, the five or six best quote unquote linebackers. So again, I still think, you know, the top four, Wilson, Singleton, um, Davion Taylor, right. And, um, and TJ Edwards, you know, Avery will probably make it in some regard and they'll use them some form or fashion. And I don't even know if they keep more than that, Josh, I really don't. Or maybe they just look on the waiver wire for, for some veterans, some experience there. Well, we are less than 24 hours to find out exactly what the, exactly the first initial 53 looks like. And then we get a, basically 
uh, what, like 12 days of evolution of the roster potentially before the first game of the season. Well, so. if you remember last year, right? I mean, last year there was never a 53. There was a 53, and then it changed the next day, and then two guys got hurt, and then all of a sudden the, you're, you're starting the season with Jack Driscoll as your right tackle and Nate Herbig as your right guard. <laughs> I mean, last season was the most ev- evolving, changing, morphing 53 that you're ever going to see. Well, at least we know one thing. I feel so far that Sirianni has been a little bit more upfront about things than Doug was, about some of these injuries at least. So at least we had that going for us instead of having to hear about Alshon Jeffrey every week that he's coming back and then he wasn't there for 10 weeks, for goodness sake. Yeah, I would say Nick's probably been slightly more forthcoming, but I mean, it was just a couple of days ago that, you know, he wasn't going to give a timetable to, to Landon Dickerson and Rodney McLeod and poof, there they are practicing today and off the list, so. But that, that's all just good news for the Eagles. That's okay. Absolutely. Jeff, one more before I let you go. Uh, a guy who has been attached to Eagles in some rumors, Deshaun Watson. So last night, Drew Rosenhaus just drops this video bomb online saying that he's gonna that Watson's going to Miami and that, that Miami's working on contingency plans to get Deshaun Watson. And then today the Texans apparently are saying that if Watson's on the roster, he'll be inactive every single week. So... Uh, this is Sean Watson stuff. It's just getting wonky again. Hold on. Time out. You lost me on one thing. Because I, I was not familiar with what you just said. Drew Rosenhaus dropped a video about this? Yeah. I'll, if uh, I guess you didn't hear. Because so Drew Rosenhaus does not represent Deshaun Watson. So it's very uncommon to see an agent making any kind of news or declarative statements about a player that he does not represent. Here, I'll, uh, I'll play the audio for you real quick. Okay. I'll, I'll pop it on the screen so you can see it. So is this from? I know he does talk show down in Miami, right? Drew Rosenhaus. Yeah, Seven a, Sports Extra. Yeah. Down in uh, Miami, South Florida. Let me just pop it up on the screen. And I'll play it for you quick for everybody watching on the stream here. Because when I saw this last night, I I almost fell over because I was like, for this guy to say this is just ridiculous. So here we go. This is Drew Rosenhaus mm-hmm. last night. Watson with the Miami Dolphins for the first game of the regular season. The Dolphins are absolutely working on this deal with the Texans. There's obviously holdups with compensation. They want three first-round picks. Plus, that's not going to happen while he has an uncertain legal future. The Dolphins have to make sure that they have contingencies in the event that these legal issues become a serious problem. But I do think there's a legitimate possibility that the Dolphins will acquire one of the best players in the NFL in Deshaun Watson. <laughs> That, that's Drew Rosenhaus just coming out of nowhere, <laughs> dropping that last night. Wow, that's amazing. Well, the wonderful thing for Drew Rosenhaus is that if he's not correct, it doesn't matter if his reputation <laughs> as a reporter takes a hit because that's not his day job. He doesn't have to quit his day job, which is being uh, a fairly, fairly, fairly good agent in the NFL. He's been quite a good one uh, as far as his list of clients and, and their, their contracts. So. Um, look, he's dialed in because he's down there. I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised to see that because a lot of times agents try to maintain their good relations with teams and executives, and they don't try to air out another team's kind of personal business like that. However, in this situation, everybody has seemingly got a, a report on Deshaun Watson, so I guess it doesn't really make Drew all that different. So we'll see. I don't get it, Josh. Like, I really don't. I guess what I don't understand is how any team, whether it's Eagles, Dolphins, anyone, would be willing to give up certain compensation right now, not knowing whether or not how, how the legal process is going to unfold for Deshaun Watson. It seems very, very risky, uh, not only risky, but also you know questionable as far as ethics, morality, whatever you want to put to it, about why you would trade for a person who has this many allegations against him unless you know something. And I don't know that all these teams uh, or any of them know. I mean, I'm sure they all do their homework, Josh, um, but – there's still a lot hanging over this, uh, this case. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I, I've, I think we've heard reports about it being close to any number of teams for quite a while now, and nothing's happened yet. At Jeff Mosher NFL on Twitter, the latest edition of the Inside the Birds podcast dropped this morning, and then we are less than 24 hours from the first 53, and you get all that coverage inside the birds.com. Jeff will be back on Wednesday. Andrew Ducheco tomorrow, moments after the 53 drops. So we'll get immediate reaction from Andrew and then the next level reaction from Jeff on Wednesday. Jeff, always good talking to you. 
You too, Josh. Have a great one.